every orthodontist out there should be at the minimum a gatekeeper for sleep disordered breathing. And I've had orthodontists tell me, no, I won't do it. You are a freaking master of the head and neck anatomy. When the med students went back to the legs, we went back to the head and neck again. And you took it in dental school, you took it again in ortho residency. We are masters of the head and neck. We know more about the maxillomandibular complex, the whole cranial features, than almost anybody out there. Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. We're going to talk about a lot of topics, which I think to us are not controversial at all. Uh, but to many of you, you know, get your tomatoes ready because you may want to throw a few if you're like that. I want to introduce Dr. Ilya Lipkin. Welcome, Dr. Lipkin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I think, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube rather than just listening to it, you probably saw him smiling a little bit at that introduction because he and I share a lot of common interests. Uh, he's really a gifted clinician. Uh, he's really a pioneer. He's pushing the envelope with some really interesting things. And yeah, I'm going to say it now. We're going to bring up some airway orthodontic stuff. That's just the nature of this conversation we're going to have. We're going to talk a lot about a very new, well, I don't want to call it new, a newer, less aggressive approach towards palatal expansion in adults, skeletal expansion in adults. And I will tell you folks, I've seen his work. Uh, he presented an amazing webinar to our Orthopreneurs RD group that just rave reviews. He's a speaker. He's a teacher. Uh, he has a course. Uh, he's a clinician. He's a bit of everything. And so, uh, Ilya, before we get started, or as we get started, do you want to give me a little bit of background about how you ended up where you are right now? Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for all the kind words. Um, They're all I true. <laughs> Thank you. I essentially, you know, I've always tried to gear my practice towards something maybe slightly less conventional or, or at least explore the areas that are, uh, you know, made sense to me. So early on, I ventured into, you know, TMJ and, and airway became uh, kind of always, uh, you know, I never, it never became like a mainstream, but it was became a big part of the practice uh, since my history is, is uh, uh, I used to do sleep tests for a living in, in college and dental school. Really? You actually yeah. administered the sleep test with all the I leads and everything? I dental, you know, sleep tests. And I have a lot of funny stories about that. But wow. uh, that's a topic for, for a different day. Well, if you're going to bring it up, you got to tell me one good story. Come on. I'll tell you my best story. <clears throat> I've worked for a pulmonologist and he had a, a sleep lab and he also had a portable equipment. And one day, so we had a patient who was like literally sleepwalking. Uh, he was so tired just talking to the physician. So uh, we you know, prescribed a sleep test. I set him up in the lab. Uh, he goes to sleep, not a single apnea episode. He sleeps like a baby. He When he woke up that next morning, he said, he said I don't think I've ever had a that good of a sleep this is i don't know what's what what did you guys do so um okay so uh uh, uh to make the long story short we decide maybe we should do a, a test at home and then we set it up i set up a test at home there's always a little camera that that, that records um and then uh, uh when we took a re reading his wife was tersing and turning all night long and then she was poking him and kicking him and she was just so such a restless sleeper. So he, she basically was his sleep apnea. So she ends up telling him, or or he's yeah, I guess he's, she, he's, yeah. he's she super actually, tired. Yeah, she she sent him to a sleep physician because he was always so tired. But uh, uh, she ended up being the cause of his of his tiredness because she, like he he would have like a couple hundred arousals a night. But no sleep apnea episodes at home. Obviously, it was just sleep apnea because she would be kicking him at night. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I had to hear a good story. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so you used to do this for a living? I used to do this in college and then in dental school. Uh, my, my wife's uh, uh, a, a uncle, uh, he used to run this, uh, used to study. So I, so I did the sleep test for a living. And, and, and I remember, you know, patients uh, like a, a young kid, uh, a teenager who was labeled, you know, HD, lazy and all that. And he had a 600 uh, uh, episodes a night of, of apnea, it's like really severe. And, wow. uh, you know, that, that when it got on my first radar, really. 
but uh, uh, didn't become a big part of the practice until a bit later. So my first scale expansion case uh, was actually 2012. I, I, I read a One Moon article. Uh, it was fascinating. It made total sense. I, you know, I, I've, I've been doing TADS for, for a while at that point. So I decided to try it on a patient. It worked absolutely amazingly. At that time, I used to just modify conventional mar expanders to, 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 to be with the TADS. Then the MSC came in. I started using an MSCs. And that's how the journey went. And then um, sometimes when you, you know, when you use the MSC and, uh, you know, primarily I was using it for just a, a space or, you know, protraction or, or this or that. But uh, inevitably, some patients reported, oh, I, you know, by the way, after you put the expander in, a couple of weeks later, my wife's telling me that I'm not snoring anymore or, or I, I sleep and feel so much better. I, I exercise and I, I could breathe through my nose uh, uh, all of a sudden that, that I couldn't do before. So all those, you know, the, the light bulb goes on and uh, then you, you start using it more and more and not just purely for space gain. And I started looking at the patients differently. Uh, I've had a cone beam since 2005. I was the first wow. orthodontist in New Jersey who had one. Um, so obviously in combination with all that, then you start looking at uh, what you do with the conventional expanders with Marpies and, and, and that's how my journey went. Uh, but uh, as far as airway, I, I really dislike the term airway orthodontist because while airway is, should be on everyone's radar, you know, I don't want to, you know, there's other structures that are important, the perio, the, the joints, the aesthetics. And, and, and I really dislike the fact that when someone says gear is everything around airway, disregarding anything else. Some, some I've seen cases where people just expand, uh, expand out completely disregarding occlusion, uh, perio stability, and, you know, just treating for the airway alone. So yeah. I mean, there's, there's a huge number of people, um, out there who hate on, you know, the airway driven or I don't want to say airway centered. I've said the same thing on my podcast before that the term airway centered orthodontics yep. or airway centric orthodontics, uh, while used in the past, right? Um, you know, I think times evolve and the great clinician, the Panky Institute, Peter Dawson. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he used to, one of the greatest educators of the last hundred years in dentistry in general. He always used to say, if you quote me, date me, right? So yeah, airway centered orthodontics was great at the beginning, but we learned, we evolved. And I think it was there because so many people were ignoring it and still are. And, you know, just a quick little addendum to what you said is there is science, really good science to yep. validate the fact that every orthodontist out there should be at the minimum, a gatekeeper for, for sleep disordered breathing it should be 100%. a gatekeeper. And I've had orthodontists tell me, no, I won't do it. It's not what, you are a freaking master of the head and neck anatomy, right? When, when the med students went back to the legs, we went back to the head and neck again, right? And you took it in dental school. You took it again in ortho residency. We are masters of the head and neck. We know more about the maxillomandibular complex, the whole cranial Absolutely. features than almost anybody out there. And I think the part of it is the loudest voices against it. And I, I don't think we should get too far into it because it's so stupid that anybody would still be against it. The ones who are so far against are the ones who've never done it. It's yeah, like it's everything definitely. else. The loudest voices are, I don't think we should. Oh, have you ever done it? No, but I don't think we should. It's like, hey, I don't like broccoli, mom. <laughs> well, have you ever tried broccoli? No. And I won't because I hate it. I'm like, okay, you take your ball and go home. And, uh, and when my, when I, when I met with a physician, a pediatrician, who's one of the heads of a hospital pediatrician's group here in Dallas, and I started talking to her about the literature. Hey, this study from this year talked about this. This study from this one did this. She said, you know, I'd really like you to come and speak and do grand rounds for our pediatricians. We're talking hundreds of pediatricians. So I stood on a stage with my ENT, and we gave a full lecture to the pediatricians about the most basic of sleep disordered breathing literature. And you know what? Almost all of them knew none of it. They'd never heard of it. They'd never even heard of the most basic studies on facial development, on, on nasal blockages and facial development, on the effects of sleep apnea. And they weren't screening. And you know what, folks? If you're an orthodontist and you're not at least screening and being a gatekeeper, I'm going to come out there and say, I just think that's wrong. So you I'm sorry. I, 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 I,
Yeah, th- no, there, were, there was an actual research and that's done in 2017 that, that said that uh, 90% of dental dentists and dental specialists don't even screen for, for sleep apnea. And, and it's just like one of those things, you know, if, if you don't see it, if you don't look for it, you don't find. Right. Like I used to, early in my career, I used to, you know, seven-year-old comes in, mild crowding, no crossbites. I would, I would dismiss him and I wait. Uh, now I, I, I give them the questionnaire, a sleep questionnaire, and then they, they have, you know, all the symptoms in the book. But, yeah. uh, you know, pediatrician says, uh, oh, he's okay. He's, he's going to outgrow it. The ENT says, oh, the, the tonsils had noise. I don't want to do them. They just here's a spray. And, and the kid's right. surviving rather than thriving. Exactly, and then, and then and then you put an expander on him, and then and then uh, you 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 expand the palate. The, all of a sudden, the kids goes gets breathing better. Obviously, not in every case, but but in many many cases, if you just start watching for it, uh, you will find it. Um, and then you, you you give them the sleep questionnaire at the end of the treatment, and and all of a sudden, half the symptoms that were there before go away. I mean, that's pretty obvious. It's what evidence yeah. based, right? And you don't, don't uh, you don't even have to give the questionnaire at the end. How many times? And again, just going back for a second, I think the part that destroys everything, and we're going to get into maxillary skeletal expansion in adults, the part that destroys everything is that, I'm not going to give a percentage, but the overwhelming majority of the people doing the kind of stuff we're talking about are working as good operators. And then there's a few out there uh, who are just crazy, right? They push the (laughs) envelopes, they get way outside of what's recommended or specified. And all of a sudden, people look at that it's like when I have discussions with general dentists about um, orthodontics and I say, I know you're doing all your own ortho, but do you really think you're doing it that well? I mean, like if you want to line up your last 50 finishes with my last 50 finishes and we'll swap them and we'll look at each other's work and their answers back to me are always, but I do better work than some crack, crappy orthodontist I've seen. I said, yeah, but you're comparing yourself to the worst of the worst. Don't right. compare, now compare yourself to the average, not the best. But compare yourself to the average and you're going to fall woefully short. And that's what happens with sleep disordered breathing. That's what happens when we talk about TMD. That's when we, anything that's even remotely questioned, it's that people will say, well, did you see what they did? Yeah, what they're doing is bananas. That's crazy. Um, it's not scientifically based, but look at what everybody else is doing. And, and the greatest part about it was there was somebody, and I bet you know who, very respected researcher, gave a lecture at AAO. Um, and, and talked about expansion in really young kids and preschoolers, right? Three, four-year-olds and what have you. And there are some very loud, obnoxious voices in the world of orthodontics that jumped on that and immediately started to say, you know, there were journal articles written about it, editorials written about it, people pointing fingers. Is this what we've become as an organization? And what they missed in the whole conversation of all of this is that nobody is coming out and saying that all three and four-year-olds should be expanded. But when I spoke Juan Moon, when I first took my first course with him, probably what, six years ago was my first time. And I'd already been expanding before that. I asked him, I said, would you do skeletal expansion on a four-year-old? And he said, well, you really don't need to, you know, in terms of like screw based. And he said, but if I did a traditional expander and it didn't work, yeah, absolutely I would. And, and, and that's the takeaway message is that, yeah, I've done expanders on four-year-olds when they meet all the criteria necessary, right? If, if the kid is, is, is suffering, literally suffering, if, if the ENT is going to do a combined approach with us and going to do tonsils or adenoids or they're not going to do septum at that age, but turbinates perhaps, and there's something going on, you know, the studies are clear. You got to expand if you're going to do tonsils and adenoids. And well, if you do tonsils- there, there, there is an actual article that, that, that compared the people, the patients who had sleep apnea and they had palate expansion and it had tonsils out noise out or both yeah. and it was clearly the, the actually expansion did better than tonsils not noise removal but yeah. in combination they had uh, an, an over 90 percent success a cure rate right right so so if the the inti doesn't want to do anything and then parent listen and the pediatric pedi- pediatrician doesn't want to do anything and you do the expansion at least you do a very minimum uh, improvement. And if the, you're absolutely correct, if, if the kid's suffering, why do we want to wait? Yeah. Uh, three or four year olds. Okay. I mean, if you want to throw a tomato at me, go for it. <laughs> and if, <laughs> you want to change, you, if you want to change your community in a really good way, speak to Audrey Yoon from Stanford mm-hmm. and ask her if she and her airway team, which includes physicians, right? ENTs, um, 
uh, uh, speech pathologists to bring them in, sponsor them for a day lecture and invite every physician, every dentist, every specialist, every pediatrician, every pediatric dentist, everybody you want to bring in, bring in ENTs and pack a room. And you know what? Not only will your practice grow tremendously as a side effect, which is not the reason to do it, but your whole community will now be speaking the same language because everybody will see the same literature. And two years ago, Orthopreneurs RD, we took the entire group, whoever wanted to go, and we filled an entire ballroom in LA and brought the Stanford Airway team up. And that was my second time doing that. And when you see Zagi talk about the literature behind tongue releases, not what your pediatric dentist is doing where every single kid gets a tongue release because they bought a laser and decided it was time, you really start to understand the difference between the literature and the sort of opinion, if you will. And so yeah. I, I know we dove deep into that and I wanna, I wanna transition, if it's okay, into, into skeletal expansion in adults and what have you. And so we've had some great surgeons on. I'm a big fan of Steve Sherry and John Gannon. They're here in Dallas. Um, they were, when I first brought them the idea six years ago about skeletal expansion, Steve Sherry looked me in the eye and said, it's not going to work. You know, this, my first patient was stupid. It was dumb. I had no idea what I was doing. And my good friend, Rebecca Bacow, uh, who was my former general dental associate back in the day, uh, she, we talk every day and I said, this is garbage. This is stupid. It's not going to work. And she finally convinced me. And who was my first patient? Like a 62 year old woman, right? Right. My first patient ever. And so I said to my surgeon, I don't want to deal with this. You put in the, the tads and let's move from there. And he said, it's not going to work. And lo and behold, it worked. It opened her up. I did it just purely to get more transverse. It had nothing to do with sleep. Mm -hmm. And, but she had a side effect. She said, by the way, I'm sleeping way better. I said, oh, great. Wonderful. Right. I didn't know anything about sleep at that point. And um, at the end of the day, Steve Sherry became one of the biggest advocates as a surgeon. And this is to his credit. He said it wouldn't work. And it did. And now he said, now I got to go learn more about this. And he and his partner, John Gannon, jumped in and learned everything they could, studied every drop of literature they could get their hands on, including everything on distraction osteogenesis to understand what was going on from a cellular level. Um, I, I, I'm going to screw up the name, and I think it was Ilizarov did all the- Almost correct. Il How do you say it? Ilizarov. Okay, fine. I, Close. It, Krieger, Krieger, it's all the same. Um, but he did all the amazing work, I think in Siberia, if I'm not mistaken, yep. on distraction osteogenesis in Russian athletes and Ru Russian uh, just citizens. And yep. so they studied all the literature to really understand it. And to their credit, they started developing approaches and processes and ways to do it. And you know, the number of patients we've done it on, in the hundreds at the very least, uh, has been amazing. And so then came along Jamil Abiev from Partners Dental Studio, a uh, great guy, love him to death. And he started talking about the tiger screw, right? And I, do you mind taking a minute or two and talking a little bit about your approach? Because you did the MSE. I did a ton of MSEs. Thank you to Juan Moon. And I think Biomaterials Korea at the time, mm -hmm. I think made that. And it worked great. It was wonderful. But there were lots of uh, sort of problems and side effects and issues and limitations that we'll talk about in a little bit. But then you moved away from that into something different. What did you move into? So I'll, I'll step back for one second. Is is essentially, you know, when I started using MSC and I did not really follow anyone's protocol, I I, I felt what should have, you know, how it should work. It, you know, to me mentally, it made sense. So I started using MSCs, and initially I used it on, you know, young patients, you know, anyone under twenty. I've not used it on adults for, for a few years. And then probably around 2006, 2015, that's when I first tried uh, an adult case after talking to uh, Richard, uh, who could, Richard Tink, who convinced, who's a great friend and, and, and uh, also a cl former classmate. So, um, and I started using it on adults and, and first everything worked great, you know, on a 40 year old, 20 year olds, and then uh, uh, I, I tried other things, and I learned about cordypunctures, and then I, uh, and then all of a sudden I started getting failures. So, and then you know, obviously, the more you do, and at some point something is not going to work. So I, I tried to reanalyze the failures, and and I, I felt that okay, maybe MSC was a little too soft, maybe the arms were too soft, maybe the bone engagement was wasn't good enough. So I actually bought a laser welder, and I started customizing. 
uh, my MSEs. Um, I started adding extensions to them. I started adding uh, actually literally like a little legs to go into if it, into a deep palettes. I, I, I made eight, eight tatted MSEs before anyone else uh, would. And then I'll show you some designs. You'll think it's, you, you know. I've uh, seen some of your designs. I've seen some, but, but I, I've got one more. You know, I got. I'm, it is I'm, amazing to me that people tolerate them. I'm, I'm amazed at the biomechanics you brought into them, but the fact that people tolerate them to me is remarkable. Yeah, but, but uh, y- y- you know, and all of a sudden, you know, I used MSC, it doesn't work. I, I change it to six, you know, four, six, five, you know, eight tads, and all of a sudden it splits. I, I very, I tried different positions. I even made uh, insane things. But, it, you know, at some point, it, and, and then Jamil came along that, that was able to not only uh, uh, print the 3D framework, uh, uh, he, we were able to now using cone beam, uh, uh, precisely place those tads to get the bicortical engagement, to get it into a, a best places where there is the most bone. So I, I don't think the tiger screw itself is, is, is a, anything special. It's just, uh, it's just a good screw better than super screw, which, you know, was failing constantly. Right. Uh, so tiger screw is just well-made screw, even though recently it looks like they had a cu- couple of uh, failures of, of, of their own. But uh, in general, I think that's a 3D printed framework and the ability to place the tads uh, uh, using Combi very, very precisely, very, very accurately. I think that's the success uh, behind the partners, Daniel and, uh, and Jamil. And, and, and he's, he's got a, a team that, that took this to an amazing level. Nice. Yeah, I think, again, Jamil was on a podcast with me a month or two ago. Yeah. A true gentleman. Uh, I haven't met anybody who's ever had a negative word to say about him. He's so uh, generous with his time. Um, I remember the first, and again, I have, be crystal clear, I have no financial interest in Partners Dental Studio or Same. anything that you do or any, you know, uh, uh, expander company of any kind. Um, and, and this just goes out there to everybody out there. If you're looking to work with somebody who just seems to be a really good human being, Jamil and Partners Dental Studio I have not let me or anybody I know down yet. And I remember the first case I did with him of a I wanted to make an expander. I showed it in Orthodox Pearls years ago and in Orthopreneurs where I, I wanted to give a tongue reminder on, a, on an Essex. And so I buried some, I don't know, O2, bore, wire, whatever it was into the model and then did a suck down over it. So it created these sort of like plastic spikes. And I said to Jamila, you know, can you make me this thing? And I mean, literally he got the STL file and the next day he sent me five pictures, which one of these works best for you? Right. And this one. Okay. But does, and it was like, he, he gave me enough, but he didn't overburden me with 50 questions and it came back and it was perfect. And he really cares about what he does and he's a real craftsman, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you working with the MSC and working with the super screw and all the other stuff that goes with it, a, they would unwind sometimes, right? You get some really yeah. strong palate. You get the expansion. You come in, nothing was turned. You go, have you been turning this? Oh yeah. Every day. And you think it was broken, but in fact, it would just unwind. Uh, right. And that was an issue um, I, I, on thin palate patients where I wanted to engage the, the, the shelf of the palate, not which I've seen you do as well with tads. It was very hard because you only had four arms and you had to weld on more if you wanted to. And it was and, and I'm not knocking it. It got us to where we want to get. It's like, you know, a Boeing 727 yeah. is not a 787, but it got us to where we needed to go to get to the 787. And, and the other thing that was a real problem, and this, this was a legitimate real issue, uh, and I remember they kept saying they'd have a, a solution for it for years, was let's just say you had a, an eight millimeter, right, MSE, and you had a very tight palate because I think eight was the smallest. They made the MSE two. They went to a six in the MSE one, but that was a traditional, you know, RPE screw, and I didn't feel it had the strength it needed. And so you had an eight millimeter and you expand, 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 and now you need more. So what did you do? You had to, it was really a dance. You had to take out the screws, you had to pull out the thing, you had to rescan them, put it back in, hold it, rush to the next one, get it in. It was just a nightmare. And though I haven't done it, you've said that the the newer appliances, you don't have to worry about that, right? Right. How does it work? Does the screw just come out and a new one goes in? Well, actually, with the conventional MSCs, which I still use, uh, there is a trick where where you could comfortably put a 10 millimeter on the narrowest of pallets. And I'll send you a picture. You'll be amazed. I have but- no doubt. <laughs> Did you have to go vertically with your arms? 
No, I mean yes, yes and no. Uh, it's just a trick of how to f- make the model and 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 how to place it. And and uh, that again, t- topic for a different conversation. Yeah, it's a- with with the uh, with this with the custom RPs because you you could really. Uh, make a custom screws to go in very very deep and and with a custom tad placement the narrow pallets is no is is, is really not an issue and and recently uh, uh and i don't know if you've ever i don't think you've seen it but uh i i i, I designed a marpy uh, you know where where after we let's say i had patients that was really really narrow pallet and i couldn't place uh bigger than uh even even bigger than 10 millimeters but she needed good 14 plus uh, so what we've done is uh, 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 we did a custom framework, but the way this the screw is, uh, when after you finish the full expansion, you literally just back it out. It, it became it's removable. You hmm. take you take it out. You put a bigger screw in. Start screwing it in. Boom, and you get got more expansion. And it's very 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 neat uh, mechanism. So it worked. <laughs> so I've got so many questions I want to ask you, so people can hear about your protocols sure. because. When you did your webinar for RD, my head kind of exploded because here I am with Sherry and Gannon, right? And then they're always learning and they're doing things differently. Um, and, you know, they would do what they found is that they identified, or at least they believe they've identified, that based on gender, age, and palatal morphology, those three factors went into deciding what were you going to do? Could you just put four mini screws in, uh, you know, with an old MSE? Uh, and just turn away. And in some cases, based on age, gender, and morphology, you could, and it'll work predictably. But all too often, unfortunately, in the orthodontic space, and I, I hate to say this, there's many orthodontists who would send me a, a message after hearing about an MSC and go, hey, Glenn, I want to get into Marpies. What do you do? I'm like, oh, so you want me to teach you the entire Bible while I stand on one foot, right? Like, like there's so much you have to know. They, and then they'll go and put one in and go, well, it didn't work. Surprise, it's you failed before you ever did anything. So they identified, you know, when do you have to just put one in? When do you need to do sort of palatal perforations, if you will, right? Or an osteotome mm-hmm. technique in the anterior spine area. And when did you need to do cuts in the zygomatical maxillary area? And, you know, I will tell you, having worked with them on many, many, many cases, the results were spectacular. And then I saw your presentation where basically, You're not doing, you know, you're not really self-selecting based on age, gender, morphology. You're putting it in. You might decide design might be a little bit different for every palette, but your approach appears, unless I'm incorrect, to be the same, right? Yeah, I have I have just a few criteria. So so uh, you know we're talking about perforations with the piezo, uh, and essentially uh, that sometimes may vary. But my my general rule of thumb is if 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 the male is twenty five or female is thirty plus, then that that will be I'll, I'll be doing a piezo uh, in the midline. I may do a little bit more aggressive for someone who is older and then really uh, massive and really narrow maxilla. Um, I might be very, very light on, on that, uh, as far as, you know, if somebody is more slender, uh, in females, traditionally, they really split almost with no issues at all. It's the males that are having, you know, bigger issue, but so far, you know, my oldest male is 63, uh, which successfully split and, uh, I have a, a tons, you know, 50 plus. So, right. um, and I, I know that might sound like an outrageous claim, but come check my records to, to see that's true. Uh, I have not had a, a failures in the past couple of years with the expansion. Doesn't matter age or, or you know, uh, gender. It's amazing. So. And, and, and folks, you did hear him correctly. He said it real fast, but he is using a peso for splitting a palate. And his technique, if I remember correctly, is obviously going up the palatal midline. And I think you wrap it over the facial of the anterior, do you not? Uh, so, correct. Uh, if I, you know, there has to be uh, uh, in a nasal spine release, but it, it it's, uh, depends on the. Sometimes the roots are so high up, and then the the area that above the roots is so small that I might not do okay. it. But I, I generally, you got to do. You got to go into the palate. And so, the most common question I think you got from the group of people you presented to in RD was, um, "What's your turning protocol?" <laughs> right. Like, like that was such a big deal to everybody is like, what's your turning protocol? And to be honest, there's a lot of leeway there when it comes to turning protocols. You, you know, what I've, again, there's so many turning protocols. I, however, uh, even in when my, 
the, the way I conclude this is from my MSC days. So when, whenever I, I, I've had more than one occasion, I start, you know, I, I, I would start turning four to six turns a, a day thinking, you know, the more, the better. Right. And then they'll come back a couple of weeks and I see the MSC start started bowing out and, and, and it's inevitably failed. And on some of those occasions, I, I turned it back and I started, you know what, let's just go slowly. Maybe it's just, just too soft to, to do this fast. And then I started doing uh, one crank a day. And then all of a sudden, on the second try, the patient split. I mean, I'm talking about adults. So, uh, and, and that's how I concluded personally, and I don't have any research data, that, that the slower it goes, the better. Uh, mm-hmm. Just just a very, very gent, uh, gentle buildup of the force. So even with the custom uh, Marpies, I, I never go, you know, uh, you know, I start with the two turns per day, and then I slow it down based on the need and, and uh, uh, you know, how, how good they're expanding. So, so a turn with this particular appliance is Fine how much? Break. Is ha- do we know how much the measurement on that I is? I think it's either one fourth or or even less of a, of a millimeter. Full turn, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's real interesting to me because again, with the MSC, it was turn, 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 and I have people come back to me with a diastem as big as their thumb, right? And to me, that was the worst part of the entire process, is because now I'm round tripping the centrals that I I took somebody posteriorly and I, I expanded them and they looked great. They're breathing better. I mean, everybody breathes better. Literally every person breathed better, but they had a diastema. I, I tell the story of an attorney who I used to treat. <laughs> you have a good story. Here's a good story. I had an attorney I treated who used to drive a pretty nice car. I can't remember exactly what it was, but let's just say it was like an Aston Martin. It was like a really sleek, nice, you know, kind of a sports sedan kind of car. And he's, he gets pulled over by a police officer who was tailing him for a while. And the police officer comes up to the window and he's really harassing him, asking if he has drugs in the car. And he's like, I don't have drugs in the car. And he keeps harassing him. Right? And he finally turned him, look, you're, he says, officer, I'm an, I'm an attorney. I know my rights. What's going on here? He says, to be honest, I saw you at the red light. I saw, I saw your, 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 your mouth. I saw you missing your front teeth. And I just <laughs> naturally assumed you're, you know, involved in method. I mean, they had a good laugh about it because he thought he was like a meth user. Because he was missing his front teeth. Wow. But in fact, his diastem was so big, it looked like he was missing his centrals. And, wow. you know, he came in and we all had a great laugh over it. He was, I was laughing only because he was laughing over it. But with your protocol, you don't see that, right? You don't get those 10 and 12 and 14 millimeter diastemas. No. Every case of yours that I saw has significantly smaller diastemas. Is that simply because you're turning slower? Yeah. Uh, sometimes, especially in the, in the patients who are professionals, uh, you know, we might, uh, what, we, what we usually do if, uh, let's say, they, they speak a lot or do, do a lot of presentations, uh, we slow it down deliberately. So they, 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 they turn until the diastema shows up. They stop for a day or two. The, the, the front teeth start drifting together. Uh, and you could restart again on either daily or, or uh, uh, you know, every other day. And then you could take a comb beam and you could see the, uh, you know, significant expansion. Sometimes you, you'll start spacing showing up distal to centrals or distal to laterals or all front four teeth start tipping a little bit. But, uh, you know, we try to prevent uh, a, a giant diastemis. Um, yeah. I, I know also there is there is there are some guys out there who like Rick Robley for example they use a whole technique with the with the clear aligners that for, you know prevent that from happening to begin with but um, you know there's many ways to do it but uh, yeah I tried not to get the giant space because that's 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 eventually going to end up with something like that's this exactly the hardest part was always I stopped trying to close it if I was doing a liner case I would just let it close on its own for the first three months. And they would tip in. And yeah, they didn't look as bad, but now you get had to get the roots underneath them. And that was just a nightmare uh, with the liners. You get them there. It just took forever. I, so, put a, I put a big square attachment on, on the uh, on the mesial part. So that's kind of becomes a lever to get the roots over. Nice. I like that approach. Um, what are some of the most common complications you find in doing your new custom uh, Marvies? Well, initially with the with the piezo, uh, the techniques evolved, right? So, uh, in what, what I watched uh, a, a, a periodontist show me the, the you know technique of the piezo, uh, Ted, Ted Shear, uh in in Texas, and uh, you know the, he he was talking about just going in and just splitting the whole palate. Um, you know, we tried that. Uh, so the 
you know, some of those techniques resulted in, in really big uh, side effects like fistulas. Um, you know, you, you sometimes miss the midline. Well, fortunately, not for me, but I've seen, I, I had a patient who came recently, they, someone did peas on him and they were completely off center. So they did the, the they, they cut like the floor of the sinus instead of <laughs> cutting the suture. Wow. So, so that, that would be a, 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 a big boo-boo. Um, right. So, uh, 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 sometimes bleeding, sometimes, uh, a non-healing it, you basically, if it doesn't heal, you basically creating a situation of like a cleft, um, it, it be, it, or some, sometimes the areas of, even though it looks like on the surface, it heals, you know, some of, and I'll, I'll you know, I'll honestly admit in some of the early cases that I've done, you know, now that I look at their cone beams a couple of years later, I still see some of the uh, bone defects in that area. So, so sometimes, you know, being a little bit less aggressive, but, uh, you know, using certain specific technique uh, makes it work. And it seems to do very, very well for the adult expansion. Nice. When you, when you do this whole procedure, and I know we've talked, your practice is such that, you know, you'll do part of the procedure, go into another room, come back, you know, maybe do the piezo, maybe you put some tads mm -hmm. and screws, what have you. How long, if, if I said, hey, Ilya, I'm coming to New Jersey. I want to get a Marpy. I'm going to sit in your chair. Get me numb. How long from the moment I sit in the chair until I'm out the door does it take for you with no other interruptions to put in a, let's call it a six, a six screw Marpy? Or you would be eight. Thank you. Because <laughs> you love me so much. That's right. And but by the way, I have to ask, why eight for me? I, m males over, over 35, it's, it's eight. I okay. find I find six just not enough lateral support. You'll get enough, you get too much uh, either posterior expansion or you won't be parallel. Okay. So I, I want to get two in the, four in the front, four in the back. Uh, usually usually laterals um, uh, at least one, at least two or four all four laterals lateral sides because the bone in the midline in the back is so thin. Uh, so but but that, that you know if if male forty plus that will be eight automatically. Well, when I turn forty, I'll let you know. All right. <laughs> yeah, so, but time-wise, for eight for eight tads, uh, and, for eight and tads, piezo. Uh, probably a, a total from start to finish, probably uh, a year, an hour and a half, maybe a okay. little bit under two hours. But it's mostly, uh, you know, it's maybe even less. Uh, I, I never really. I know when when they, when we schedule those patients uh, on our, our normal busy day, it it, it takes about uh, uh, you know two hours. But again, it's me going in and out. Right. Uh, we usually also, if it's a Invisalign or in braces, we usually do a, a lower arch bonding uh, or Invisalign insertion at the same time. Um, when I do my courses, it takes about an hour and a half, but I talk a lot and I show a lot of stuff. So probably I would say, you know, an hour and a half would be a pretty reasonable estimate. Nice. Now, are you, are you pre-planning these with CBCTs and things like that? Every time. I've never placed one of the cut. I, I have no. I'm just saying this right now. As a GP, I did full mouth reconstructions. I did, you know, round, I did everything. As an orthodontist, I got to be honest. As my one of my directors once told me, my goal is to learn more and more about less and less. Right. And so I, I don't want to be placing tads and, and not tads, but marpies in my office. And my, I have a surgeon who'll do it very inexpensively. I'm happy to outsource that. But when you do use these. Are the screw holes like guides? Do, it, do they guide you into the right position based upon where you place them off the CBCT? So you basically you put it up there. And once it's seated, you know you can basically drill away and you're not going to touch anything. You're not going to hit any vital structures. Is that how it kind of works? Uh, yes. So, so, so with, for the custom RP, the, the, the screw, the tad holes do become guides. But there is a technique to it uh, as well. So because sometimes, you know, I keep hearing, oh, we put a custom RP in and all of a sudden the tads don't go in or, or they get, or get, get stuck or jammed. So there's there's technique for everything, how to put it pr more properly, like using a pilot drill, but not just any pilot drill, like a very specific one from a BMK. Um, if you're using the BMK TADS, um, uh, and yes, it's, it's guided from start to finish. Absolutely. Nice. And, and, and but you need to pre-plan it before you ever, uh, you know, the full, full, you know, people sometimes 
I uh, see a case and they oh we were going to do expansion, and then but they never planned the case from start to finish to begin with. They just, just order order the expander. Uh, so you know full orthodontic diagnosis and, and pre planning has to go into every single case because uh, you know some of those asymmetries that we see and, and and some of those disasters that that happen. I think I think it's just through the lack of planning. I agree 100. percent And it's not just lack of planning. And maybe with you, it's lack of plan. I don't think you face that issue. But I, again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. I think there's too many orthodontists out there who hear of a cool technique and they, they think of the outcome and not the process. Oh, yeah. I'm going to put in a tad, put in six tads. I know how to put in tads. I'm going to put this thing in. I'm going to put them go. And we're going to turn like, no, take a course, learn how to do this, which leads me to my next, next question. Talk to me a little bit as we start getting a little bit low on time here. Tell me about your course. Uh, it's it's a one day. Uh, I know. Actually, b- before I continue, I would say I, I take take all courses. Take Van Moon's course. Take Marianne Evans' course. Take Richard Ting's course. Uh, uh, you know, you know, every one of us teaches. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, Audrey Yoon's course. Everyone's teaching things slightly differently. We do the same thing, and we don't do the same thing. Uh, so, like uh, one guy said. You know, when, when they took everyone's course, they feel like they t- did a grand slam of <laughs> Murphy. Um, my personal course, I, I usually teach if, if, if I if it's my own course, I, I would do a, a one day, like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, it would be pretty intense. I, I, I would teach the I would review some basics. It's, it's probably better for people who already tried it and, and, and uh, maybe had some success, but not really fully comfortable. Uh, I, I don't go too much into the very, very basics of it, but, uh, you know, do some. Um, and then we go over the, uh, the, 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 you know, details and tricks of placing, of, of diagnosing. Um, and then we, we do have a, a live uh, a patient, usually male with PISO, uh, assisted uh, uh, placement. And they, they, they get to see it. At, at, you know, I have a camera that mounts on my head, so it's, you could really see it up and close from, you know, what I really see. Um, I go over various techniques. Now we uh, dive into some failures and, and, and we talk about a lot of, a lot of clinical cases. And sometimes some of the participants bring their, their own cases and uh, we review those. Nice. So if people want to learn more about your courses, how do they uh, reach out and learn more? Uh, they could just text me, uh, 201-394-8162. Say it one more time, just in case it, they didn't hear yeah. it. 201-394-8162. My cell phone, just shoot me a text. I'm interested in taking your course. I'll tell you that my next dates is in March 23rd and June 1st. Nice. Dr. Ilya Lipkin, I want to say thank you to you for being here today. Um, you blew me away when you gave your presentation back in RD. <laughs> You're really... Um, cutting edge uh, on things that are now becoming more commonplace because you're cutting edge on this. And uh, I myself, when I get my Marpy, I will certainly be going for a custom designed tiger screw based, you know, just the whole nine yards uh, because I'll need it at some point. I want to want to breathe a little better. And so um, thank you for being here. want to wish you a great day. Thank you for having me. Hopefully the folks who are listening in will give you a call and learn more about some of the fantastic stuff you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much.